Thank you, uh, the Honourable Amy Adams. Mr Chairman, thank you. Uh, look, I do want to take a call on part one, which is clearly the uh, most significant part of the bill, and talk a little bit about uh, where we are and, and the SOP that I'm tabling today to, to pick up on some of the issues that have been raised since the bill was last before the House, and that I think uh, did make some very valid points that we wanted to address. And I want to thank uh, members across the House who have worked with me constructively on some of the issues that they've seen with the bill, because what I do accept, Mr Chairman, is that this is a new regime. Uh, I make no apology for that because we are dealing with new uh, and insidious threats that simply weren't around uh, in, in, in you know, years gone by and that I think it is uh, absolutely our responsibility to respond to and, and provide for so that people in New Zealand are properly protected. And I think one of the uh, matters that we're all really agreed on is that there is real significant harm that can be caused through uh, digital means, that there, there is a new threat pattern and a very real and very serious threat pattern uh, that this House has to respond to. And, and I was very much guided uh, by the report of the Law Commission in 2012 on this area. And for anyone who hasn't read that piece of work, uh, who is following this debate with interest, I really do encourage them to go back to the Law Commission's report, which notes that you know, for people up to the age of 30, we're talking about 20% of New Zealanders suffering from this. So it's not a small fringe group. Uh, and I think we can probably safely say that that number uh, is likely to grow uh, as, as digital means of communication become even more prevalent than they are now. One of the things that I do want to, to take a little bit of issue with, though, in terms of how the debate's progressing so far, is that the majority of this framework is about education and civil action. The, the ultimate criminal sanction that is in it, and I will come back to talk about that, is a very, very small, uh, it's a very, very small number of cases that are ever likely to trigger the requirement for that. But I absolutely and strongly have the view that you do need to have the option of a criminal sanction for the most severe, the most vile and reprehensible and egregious types of conduct that we can see and that, frankly, we have seen uh, already in New Zealand and around the world. But actually, the largest part of this framework is around setting up an approved agency which will work with education of the community, uh, the stakeholder groups will work on mediation and mediated outcomes is likely to be the most common uh, re response and resolution of issues raised. And where I agree with the member who's just resumed her seat, is that it is critical that that agency is uh, whether we make a very clever and careful choice as to who that agency is and that they are appropriately resourced and tasked with working in the community because they, they will have a role uh, which is a very high trust role uh, which will require the community to understand that you know when they're talking they're doing so from a, a sensible and balanced position of wanting to enhance and support digital communications but educating people around a the harm that can be caused uh, and b that the the societally accepted limits of how that conversation uh, and, and that communication can work. And that actually, you can cause real significant harm uh, to people through what, what can be sort of the, the actions of, of a few seconds. So education is the first and most important part of it. The second uh, step in the, in, the, in, the, in the framework down is then mediation of complaints that arise. And anyone we talk to in this space who's worked in it is very clear that the vast majority of, of issues will be resolved through mediated outcomes with the house of, help of the approved agency. The next uh, level of, of, of severity is then if that doesn't work and only if a complaint has been made to the approved agency and the approved agency's had time to work through it and try and resolve the complaint on a mediated way, then you can, uh, there is the application to the court for civil orders. Now, civil orders are when for the, despite of the best efforts of the parties involved, the content host and the approved agency, a resolution can't be reached. The approved agency can't order anything, and that's appropriate for an agency of that nature. But the court will have the ability to use a civil order to seek the, the materials removal where that is appropriate. And that's critical. That's why it has to go to the court, because we are dealing with constraints on how people communicate. And for all of the sort of scare stories that go round about it'll be some trivial little thing that someone gets miffed at. Well, the trivial little things that someone gets miffed at are not going to reach the standard of the sort of breach of the communication principle that are going to warrant the court to make a civil order taking it down. So I think that has to be borne in mind. And then at the, at the most serious level 
uh, of the framework, there is a criminal offence. Uh, and as I've said, I don't uh, make any apology for the fact that it's there. I don't accept, first of all, that it's inconsistent with what's happening internationally. We know actually that Australia has had an equivalent offence for more than 10 years, uh, and that has been operating well for them, and they don't need to replicate it because they already have it. Uh, and we know that, Mr Chairman, oh, we know that the UK, for example, has also just passed a new offence to deal with revenge porn. So they had some offences already. Their offences weren't crafted broadly enough to deal with revenge porn. Uh, and so they have also just legislated to create a criminal offence dealing with those sorts of matters. So I certainly don't accept that it's moving in a direction that's inconsistent with international norms. The other point that I wanted to address is this fallacy that it will criminalise children. First of all, children, uh, being those under 14 in our law, are not criminally liable under this offence in any way, shape or form. No child under 14 can be criminalised for this offence. Young people, those between 14 and, seven, uh, 14 and 16, are able to be uh, prosecuted under this law if it meets those most serious tests. But, and this is a very important but, any young person who is caught up through this would go through our youth court processes. Uh, and that's a significant difference. It's not going off to court and handcuffs and being arrested. Our youth court processes, first of all, have a very, actually a very well established and incredibly well respected process for dealing with young people to ensure that they're not charged if they can be, uh, if they can be at all avoided, if through, if through family group conferences and restorative type practices, uh, a better resolution can be found and that's always sought. And if they do need to go through to a court hearing, then the youth courts are very well designed to ensure they get that balance right between the young person having to take responsibility and accountability for their actions and having to make some sort of retribution or apology as is appropriate to the victim. But they are very, very well versed and I have total confidence in them being able to properly handle uh, any young person who comes before them in that matter. Can I just talk briefly about uh, some of the other issues in the SOP uh, that have been referenced by a couple of speakers? Uh, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, Tracy Martin from New Zealand First, who's worked very constructively with us uh, around the penalties that relate to that offence provision to ensure that it's very clear that there is a, a, an infringement fee option available, which was sort of there by operation of law, but I think Ms Martin made a good point that it's much better to make it very clear and specific uh, that as well as, uh, as the, um, impri uh, the imprisonment option, that a, a fine option is absolutely uh, appropriate in many cases and we've now explicitly provided for that. And I think we've got those levels about right so that where it's absolutely necessary uh, that the level of the fine can be set at a high enough severity it is there, uh, but, but equally allowing the court full discretion to go with a lower level of fine when that is appropriate. The other change, again, is, is really a clarification, but I think a very useful one, which is around the safe harbour provisions. Uh, and there was concern expressed from some quarters that, in fact, the safe harbour provision, which I want to acknowledge the Select Committee, because I know they worked very hard to make sure they had that balance right between giving the, the poster of the information enough time to say, well, actually, no, there's nothing wrong with that. I should be allowed to communicate in that way. Uh, and equally, not leaving it so long that re-victimisation occurs. And the Select Committee set it on 48 hours as being the appropriate period, and I, I certainly didn't want to interfere with that because I think they went through a very good, robust process. But we did want to make it absolutely explicit that there was nothing in that that in any way prevented any content host acting under their own terms and conditions or their own views of what was appropriate for them as a content host to either take the information down immediately, if that's what they would do today if someone complained or they thought that was appropriate, or equally not to take it down at all. So if someone complains on a very trivial basis of saying, well, I don't like someone's, you know, put up a photo of me and I've got my eyes shut, I don't, I, I, who knows, but some triviality, it is absolutely open to the content host to say, well, look, I'm not taking any action on that, that's a nonsense, uh, and, and, as they would now. So I think it's important that the bill is absolutely clear that they have the option to act immediately and remove, they have the option to take no action if that's appropriate, and if they want to follow the safe harbour provision in the bill, then that is very clearly set out, uh, and as I've said, I think is in a robust position uh, from where the select committee has got to. So, Mr Speaker, the, the changes in the bill, and you'll notice there are a number of, of really m minor drafting changes which I don't think this House will concern itself with greatly, but I think the bill has been uh, improved as a result of that interaction, and again, can I thank the members 
members of not only this House but of the internet community have certainly engaged with me and raised some issues that I thought were valid. We didn't agree on every issue, uh, but certainly where they've raised points around workability and clarity, uh, we were very anxious to get that right. Uh, and Mr Speaker, I think the be bill is better for it as a result. Uh, and I'm certainly looking forward to this bill passing and becoming law so that we can say to New Zealanders that they uh, do have an avenue available to them for real effective remedy uh, when they are unfairly attacked, demonised and victimed in a way that causes serious harm on the internet. That isn't currently the case. To suggest to a young person that they can go off and get an injunction or a defamation remedy is simply a nonsense. This is real practical assistance and I'm looking forward to it passing.